me. Thank you, Laura. Well, welcome to Christ Church Presbyterian for the evening service, both members and visitors. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord in the evening. Um, the announcements are as per the bulletin. A couple things. VBS starts this week, and lots of work, I'm sure, has been put into that. So, so put VBS in your prayers. Uh, Wednesday night fellowship has been canceled although Stan says that the choir will meet on Wednesday night. So choir members, please don't forget to show up. Um, Friday, ladies' Bible study has been canceled because of EBS. The men's uh, Friday early morning prayer group will meet, as always, in 
guys, if, uh, if you get a chance, come. That's always a, a good time. We pray for the, the church and our, our members. And then there's the men's Bible study on Saturday morning. And uh, Bruce Wanamaker is going to introduce the summer study into Proverbs. We, we have a nice mix of, of guys. We have young guys and we have some of us who are chronically more, or chronologically more mature. We might be chronic, but we're, we're also chronologically more mature. Uh, it's a good time, it's a good time of fellowship. It, it allows us to, to uh, meet each other and get to know each other a little more and study the word. So come if you can. The women of the church have their ladies of eight and they have their movie night. Um, so ladies, be attuned to that. There's a request, as there always is, for nursery volunteers and Sunday school teachers for the fifth and sixth grade. So if you can do that, sign up. Um, speaking of signing up, don't forget the fellowship pad at the end of the row. Please sign that. Uh, if you see a name on it that you don't recognize, make sure you go and meet and greet at the end of the, at the, end of the service. Our call to worship this evening um, comes from Psalm 92, 1 through 4. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp and to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come into your house this evening to worship and to praise you, the triune God. We come to read, sing, pray, and preach your holy word. Send the Holy Spirit to indwell us Dismiss from our minds the cares and the stresses of this world and help us to focus on you. Speak to us, Lord, in this time we pray in Christ's name, amen. Let me invite you to take your family song collection, number eight. Number eight is a call. Rise up, O people of God. Let's stand and sing about that. Jay and Nancy Mansinger to come up. Uh, I think most all of us know them, but if they're visitors or they're new members of the church, the Mansingers uh, were in Europe from uh, uh, 1988 to 2015 for MTW and Greater Europe Mission. They were in, they were in France and they came home back uh, in 2000, I guess 15, for a couple of years, because Nancy had some medical problems that they got squared away, I hope. And she went back, they, they went back to Prague. And they stayed there until they retired last year. So you two come and share with us. Just like the psalmist said, it is a joy 
It's a joy to be here with you. Uh, last year we celebrated 35 years with uh, MTW and Greater Europe Mission, and um, many of you were with us in those days, and then a little later on, Christ Church. And we just want to say from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you uh, for your part in, in the ministry and uh, your prayers all those years and uh, it's a joy. We did return after Nancy's cancer uh, to Prague uh, instead of France. I won't go into that whole story. Uh, it's something we never expected, but the Lord had provided and he provided all the way through, uh, including a, a doctor in Prague to follow her case up. And we are grateful for that. We were there three years. And the third year was the pandemic year. It started. And we're just coming out of that now, but um, we were there for a year in our apartment, and so we had to transform all our ministries to Zoom meetings. We were meeting in cafes, we were having Bible studies in our apartment and prayer meetings, and we had to transfer all that to Zoom. And uh, then at the end of that first year of pandemic, we realized we, uh, the Lord was calling us to come back and relocate in the States. But we did keep up the Zoom meetings all this last year, and uh, we retired. We're no longer salaried, but we are volunteers and on associate status. And so just two weeks ago, we got a chance to go back to Prague for two weeks to see the people we had been ministering to on Zoom meetings face to face. Yeah. Yeah, we, we had a really good ministry trip to Prague. It was very encouraging. Uh, it was all about seeing people. And um, our son, our older son, lives there. Uh, he works as a tour guide. And he was part of the connection that got us from France to Prague at, at a certain point. But um, he has been a great asset to us in connecting us with people, with his friends. And, and so, um, it was really good to see again people we've been meeting with online. Uh, and for outreach, uh, we had been doing English. And so, for example, there's one guy, we started meeting with him three and a half years ago in the cafes. At that time, he told us that he was an atheist, like everybody in Czech Republic. And um, little by little, the Lord worked and made an opening where he started asking us questions and it resulted in us uh, reading the Bible with him when we were meeting for English. So we've read a lot of, uh, a lot of scripture with him and he, never, he doesn't say anymore that he's an atheist. Uh, he still has questions. He likes Jesus, but he's not sure about some things. So we keep meeting with him. He picked us up at the airport. He took us out for a lunch. And again, we talked about some of his questions and gave him a little booklet about suffering, and um, he's, he's a guy that we would appreciate your prayers for. Um, on the other hand, there's this graduate student, a, a Czech woman, who we've been meeting with for about two and a half years, and uh, we've spent a lot of time with her online. We ended up uh, reading through all seven books of the Chronicles of Narnia. Um, <laughs> And sadly, she shows no spiritual openness. Uh, she is not interested in God. We, we shared the gospel at one point, and she said, doesn't interest her. So we have this warm re relationship with her. We spent time with her too, but she's not interested in the Lord, and we'd appreciate your prayers for that sort of person too, who this is so resistant. Um, we were able to see this young woman who is from Singapore, who has become um, like a disciple over the years. Uh, she got into our Discovery Bible study in Prague and uh, then she ended up doing some traveling. She formerly was an actress in Asia. She was an award-winning actress, but she really got on fire with the Lord and uh, wanted to become, um, um, well, a servant of the Lord wherever he would call and she's, been all around the last two years. She's spent some time in the UK and in France, and we've been able to keep up with her all this time. And she happened to be in Prague the same time we were, so we got to see her, and that was a great blessing. 
um, well, we could go on and on, but the stories take too much time. But we really appreciate you hanging in there, especially in the area of prayer. We still need prayer. We're trying to continue doing uh, online meetings with people in Europe, not just Czech Republic, but also old friends from France we meet with also. And um, we hope to make at least one trip back to Prague and possibly also France at least once a year, at least two weeks once a year. Um, so we really appreciate your continued prayers. Thank you. Mel, do you want to come up and oh. pray for the Mad Singers? We thank you, both uh, both of you, we thank you for the years of service and mm -hmm. just wanted to say that to you. I'm, I'm the missions chair and uh, we've known Jay and Nancy since before they went to, to <coughs> France uh, many years ago. So uh, will you pray with me now as we pray for them in their retirement. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these uh, 35 years of service to you that uh, Jay and Nancy have given, mostly in France. We know what uh, how difficult the work in that country is, and frankly, in all of Europe. We pray that you would give them lasting fruit for their labors in those years. We pray for uh, those in France and in the Czech Republic who, have, who they have ministered to and witnessed to, talked with, rubbed shoulders with, whatever, uh, through the years. We ask that you would uh, draw them to yourself and draw many others and plant your church in new places in those countries, we pray, uh, for your own sake, for your own glory, and to bring uh, the, uh, the king home quickly. We pray for Jay and Nancy now as they retire. We pray that you would give them uh, strength, that you would allow them these trips back to Europe. Um, we thank you for the opportunities that we have through Zoom uh, in to touch base with individuals to still continue witnessing and we ask that you would give them many years of fruitful labor yet we pray for their children and grandchildren and ask that you would draw them all in your time and in your uh, own way to a knowledge of their sins forgiven a uh, desire to serve you and uh, we pray that you would do this for them and keep, take them home when the time comes for uh, uh, for a, re a homecoming that is just uh, a celebration of many years of service to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Matthew 21, 22 says, and Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Let us go to prayer. Oh God, we come before your throne this evening to worship you, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We confess with our finite minds that we cannot truly fathom your greatness. Since the fall, the human race has tended to worship a God of its own imagination and creation, not the true God. Help us, O oh God, to know you more fully. You are almighty, eternal, omnipotent, pure, holy, just, yet merciful. You created us with free will, knowing full well that we would sin. Yet in your mercy, you sent us a savior in the form of a mere babe. He was born in the most humble of surroundings in a manger. He lived a sinless life in a world of temptation and evil. He taught us about humility, love and sacrifice. He went to the cross for our salvation to restore our relationship with you. Praise be to thee, O God, for this gift, the greatest gift man has ever received. Help us to fathom the blessings that you have, show, that you have showered upon us and help us to be a blessing to our fellow man. We confess our many <coughs> sins of commission and omission. We put too much emphasis on self and not enough on worshiping and serving you, not enough on serving our fellow man. We thank you 
for our faith, our church, our church family, our nuclear families, our country, our freedoms, our worldly goods, and our well-being. We take for granted our bounty. Forgive us. We have many supplications. We pray that you will protect us from the evil one, that you will protect us from the temptations of this world in which we live. We pray for forgiveness of our many sins. We pray that your church universal and our church will hold high the cross of Christ, that we will be a beacon of light in this ever darkening world. Give us courage to evangelize, to step out and to help those less fortunate than ourselves, to use our talents and resources to help our fellow man. We pray for our staff and for all those who work in the church's programs, protect them from evil. We pray for our missionaries here and abroad, those who actively serve and those who have served. We pray for our session, give them wisdom and caring hearts. We pray for our deacons, give them diligence in their task. We pray for our country. We pray for revival in this land. We pray for peace and reconciliation between all the factors in our country. We pray for the end of wokeness in our culture. We pray for the safety of our judges and their families. We pray for true justice for all our people, including the unborn. Lord, as evil as we are, we pray you will not turn your face from us. We pray for our leaders on both sides of the aisle. We pray that you give them wisdom. We pray for our military and first responders, protect them and give them strength. We pray for our congregation. Where there is sickness, give health. Where there is strife, give peace. Where there is fear and sadness, give comfort. We pray for the people of the Ukraine, protect them. We pray for the end of hostilities. We pray that your church will grow in that land and that many will come to know you. We pray as always that we will abhor evil, cling to what is good, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, steadfast in prayer and given to hospitality. Give us the strength to overcome evil. Lord, may we act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you this day and all the days of our lives. May Christ be in us and we in him. May the God of peace be with us. May Jesus deliver us from the wrath to come. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Will the deacons come forward? Let us pray yet again. O oh Lord, you have showered us with your bounty. May we never take our blessings for granted. All we have is from you. As we give back to you, may we do so with thankful hearts. Use these resources to grow and strengthen your church and bring many souls to saving faith. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
In our family song collection again, number 39. 39, as we sing again, let's stand. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I, if you're using the Pew Bible in front of you, this is page 986. I have to admit tonight we are going to start a new study on 1 Thessalonians. Uh, last week, <clears throat> Ryan started a new study in Colossians. Uh, the beginning of these two letters is much the same. Both were written by Paul and are somewhat similar, so you may hear a little bit of a residual of Ryan from last week, but no worries. Uh, I do three Sundays. He does one, so I'm going to pull ahead of him, and then he will eventually say everything that I have said, so it's going to work out great, I promise, all right? Uh, some of it may be a review, hopefully not a whole lot. We're going to be reading First Thessalonians 1, 1 to 10, but I'm really only going to be looking at verse 1. And make sure that when you find 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, that you also hold on to Acts chapter 16 and Acts 17. So flip in your Bible to Acts 16 and 17, because everything that happens at the beginning of this planting of this church comes right out of the book of Acts, which I love. All right. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, hear the inerrant and infallible word of God. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy... To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all of the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. But they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception that we had among you. And how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful to close out the Lord's day together in your word. 
And Lord, we do pray as we always pray that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our minds to comprehend what you have for us. Even as we dig into this beautiful letter, Lord, we pray that you would convict our hearts to be more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I do believe, and I think most of you would agree, that letter writing is a lost art today. Uh, Most people just send text or emails. In fact, I have a friend that when you call him on the phone says, "If uh, if this message is longer than four seconds, I'm not going to listen to it. And so what I would do is I would call him and leave three seconds worth of message and then hang up and call him back and finish. And it would take 10 or 12 times, but I would get the full message in three seconds at a time. He didn't really think that was funny. Many people today do nothing more than send text or emails. In fact, most people today write how they would text. They don't write letters. They simply text in a letter. For instance, in writing a letter, we may say, I thought that this was really funny. If we put it in a text, we use what? LOL, right? You actually need a degree in texting to understand all that's out there today. Here's some examples. Do you know that R-O-F-L means rolling on the floor laughing? I had to learn that. I C Y M I, in case you missed it. L M K, let me know. N V M, never mind. T B H, to be honest, just in case you were thinking that you were not going to be. B T W seems pretty simple. By the way, here's my favorite T L. Semicolon DR. Too long didn't read. I bet that abbreviation is used quite a bit. What is the goal of all this abbreviation? Some say, listen, let's try to keep it simple, move on as quickly as we can. Others say, all we're doing is creating laziness, laziness in the heart of people that really can't write letters anymore. My wife is a teacher, as you know, and She has to tell her students all the time, stop texting me when you write a paragraph. Stop texting me when you write a paragraph. You must use words, no abbreviations. What we have here in 1 Thessalonians is a letter from Paul to the church in Thessalonica. Now the entire letter can be read from beginning to end in about 15 minutes. So don't tell me that it is TL semicolon DR. If you just sit down and read it in about 15 minutes, you can cover the whole letter. But this letter is full, if we slow down, of encouragement and exhortations and instructions and really the affection of Paul and Silas and Timothy to this Thessalonian church. Tonight our goal is to understand the Thessalonian church. Why would Paul even write this letter? How did it wind up in our Bible? What are we looking forward to as we dig into this letter? Let's jump in. Roman number number one is really the history. We're going to start with the history of the city of Thessalonica. This is very important because uh, Thessalonica was actually a port city in Macedonia during the days of Jesus and Paul, which was located on the eastern coast of Macedonia, which really doesn't mean much to any of us because we don't really study this most of the time. But we do know that Thessalonica is between the Balkan mountain range of the Greek peninsula. Now, Thessalonica was a part of the greatest empire ever known in human history. You see, King Philip II, who had a son named Alexander, who became Alexander the Great, King Philip II had conquered the Greek city-states and had become the king of Macedonia. And he had planned to really invade all of the territories to the east, which were occupied by the Persians, and that included this area that is now called Thessalonica. But he was assassinated in 335 B.C. And so his son, Alexander III, known to us as Alexander the Great, inherited his kingdom. Alexander decided that he was going to continue the reign and he was going to continue to push toward the east and conquer the lands that were there. He conquered the lands and extending the Macedonian kingdom as far south as Egypt and as far east as the Indus River in India, the largest kingdom in the history of mankind. But Alexander was poisoned and he died at the ripe old age of 33 in 323 BC. By that time, the kingdom was so large 
that they had to split it into four provinces because nobody could decide who was going to be the next king. And a man named Antipater took Macedonia and Greece, and he became the king. But he died simply three years later. And this military man named Cassander managed to get the throne from his successor and establish his connection with the royal family by marrying into it. He actually married the daughter of King Philip II, who was the half-sister of Alexander the Great. So there was some politics going on. This woman's name, Philip's daughter, Alexander the Great's half-sister, was named Thessalonica. And after they got married, he decided in his kingdom that he was going to take 26 towns and villages and put them together to create this port city of Thessalonica, naming it after his wife in 316 B.C. So about 300 years before Jesus comes. Thessalonica was the perfect location. It was a port city. It was close to the sea. It was great for travel and sea trade. It also had abundant fertile soil and abundant rain and rivers. The, the climate was continental. It really wasn't Mediterranean, which meant that you could grow grains and fruit, and you didn't have to worry about olives and dates, which is what everybody else was growing. The other regions were struggling to grow grains, and so it became a trade route. Thessalonica had an abundant supply of timber for construction of boats and houses. Thessalonica was close to mines of gold and silver and copper and iron and lead. And by the time Paul writes this letter, Thessalonica is now under Roman rule. Thessalonica was also the perfect city for inland trade because of what Rome had done. And you know what they did? They built roads. And there was this really large, wide and long road called the Via Ignatia that ran through the city. This was a huge Roman road that everyone traveled on. It ran across the entire Macedonian area for 696 miles. In some areas, it was as wide as 20 feet. And then there were other areas because of the terrain that had come down to about six feet. It was great for trade. It was always filled with pedestrians and horses and mules and carts and it was very crowded from time to time, so crowded that even the military had trouble getting the troops in and out of that particular road. It was also good for pirates to jump and to steal and to rob you because they knew that that's the road you travel. It was this road, the Via Ignatia, that was the major route for land trade, which gave Thessalonica not just the sea as a port, but also the land. Cicero called this road the great military road which goes through Macedonia. In fact, if you Google it, you can see it even today. Here was the problem. When they fell under Roman rule and they eventually ran into the Roman emperor who finally took them down, gave them the appearance of freedom, but stripped them of everything that created this affluence. They put, the Romans put so much restrictions on the Thessalonica that their economy could not recover. Rome was the one who stopped them from digging the gold in the silver mines. They told them you can't do that anymore. Rome told them they couldn't cut down trees for building that they couldn't cultivate their own crops. Rome eventually took this area and cut it into four districts. And they wouldn't let anyone from one district marry somebody out of another district. And of course, all of them had to pay taxes to Rome. This created great poverty for Thessalonica, even though they were sitting on the richness of their own land. 
It was a way for Rome to remain in charge. After a season, the people began to grow tired and they waited for a time of rebellion. There was always tension between the Romans and the Greeks. The Romans would squelch any talk of a new king that was rising up. The Greeks would hear of a talk of a new king and they would rally around it thinking that this guy was going to liberate them and bring them their kingdom back. That's why it's so important when we read in Acts 17, 7, it says all of them break the laws of the Roman emperor by claiming that someone uh, named Jesus is king. See, the Romans blame Jesus for declaring himself to be king when Paul shows up to plant the church there. There was always this tension between them. One theologian says it this way, the proclamation of another king by the name of Jesus would have aroused the deepest concerns among the Romans that the Macedonian monarchy was once again on the rise. The royal theology of the Christians clashed with the imperial claims of Rome while it was resonating with ancient aspirations of the Macedonian people. That's a little bit of the history of where we came from and how Thessalonica got to where it is. But what about religion? Even the Bible teaches us, we don't have to go extra biblical here, the Bible teaches us that it was a pagan city. In Acts chapter 28, it mentions pagan gods that this city was worshiping. It is this city, Thessalonica, that Paul, Silas, and Timothy are called to go. In Acts chapter 16, we read that Paul was on his second missionary journey. The year was around 49 or 50 AD. He was with Silas. It says Silvanus. It's the same name. He was with Timothy and he was with Luke. We know that he was with Silas and Timothy because they are actually listed in the book of Acts. But we also know that Luke was with them because Luke actually wrote the book of Acts. And it says in Acts chapter 16, we were looking for a way to go. So Luke was with them at the time. They're on their second missionary journey, at least Paul is. And he gets this vision in the middle of the night. Acts chapter 16, verse 9. During the night, Paul had a vision of someone from Macedonia who was standing there and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we began looking for a way to go to Macedonia. We were sure that God had called us to preach the good news there. So the next day, the three of them, without Luke, they sailed from Troas to a place called Neapolis. And then they begin to walk down this road, the Via Ignatia, until they came to Thessalonica, where they go into the synagogue and they begin to preach. Acts 17, verse 1. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. We know what not a few means, right? All right, verse five. But the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob. They set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world 
upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people of the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So here's what's happening. Paul, Silas, and Timothy show up. They go into the synagogue. They begin to preach the gospel. Jesus is the Messiah. And people come to faith in Christ. And they actually plant a church there. Acts tells us that they were there for three Sabbaths. The Bible says that Paul used the scriptures. He told them that Jesus is the Messiah. And it says some believe, verse 4, some Gentiles and important women The Jewish leaders got jealous. They formed a mob and they ran them out of town. But what we see in just a few verses is actually the name of one of the first converts in Thessalonica. So if you ever play Bible trivia, now you know the first convert that is listed from Thessalonica is a man named Jason. Just thought I'd throw that out. So Paul, Timothy, and Silas leave Thessalonica. Remember, this is during Paul's second missionary journey. And while he is in Athens, still on his second missionary journey, he hears of things that's going on back in the church that they had planted. He was concerned about their new faith in the face of the trials and all of the stuff that they were walking through and going through and the oppression and even the persecution. And so what does he do? He looks at young Timothy and he says, I need you to go back to Thessalonica and I need you to tell me, bring a report to me on how they're doing. So Timothy comes back and he tells him that though they are being persecuted for their faith, they are remaining faithful. And it creates this overwhelming joy in Paul's heart. And that's what we are going to see really in chapters 1 and 2 of 1 Thessalonians. And it is out of that report that Paul, along with Timothy and Silas, they write a letter that is to go back to the church in Thessalonica, encouraging them and exhorting them to remain faithful. And that letter is 1 Thessalonians that's in our Bible. This letter came to them in full authority. That's Roman number number 2. 1 Thessalonians 1, 1 says Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Three of the prominent people of the day that everybody in Thessalonica, at least the church in Thessalonica, knew. In order for a letter to be received, it must come with authority. And here, the first thing we see is that the letter carries some weight to it. It is certainly authoritative by virtue of the fact that Paul lists three people who actually sent it, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. The beauty is that each one of these men had this tremendous impact on the church in Thessalonica. All three were there when it was founded and were also there together when the letter was written toward the end of Paul's second missionary journey. I want to briefly look at these three men. I think it's very important because what the Thessalonians viewed, the Thessalonians, how they view Paul and Timothy and Silas gives us really the authority in which the letter was received. Start with Silas. Listen, before Silas actually joins Paul on this second missionary journey, we know that Silas was the leader in the Jerusalem church. And he exercised this prophetic ministry. He taught the word. Acts chapter 15, verse 22 says Silas was a leading man among the brothers. And we know in Acts chapter 15, when the Jerusalem council meets and they begin to talk about, does a Gentile have to be circumcised in order to be saved? Does a Gentile have to become a proselyte? Do they have to become Jewish in order to be saved? The Jerusalem council said, no, they do not. And what do they do other than look at Silas and a couple of other men? And they say, you take this letter to the churches around and tell them this was our decision. He was actually appointed along with Judas to accompany Paul and Barnabas when they delivered the news to the local churches. He was a prominent leader. He was a faithful servant. And after Paul and Barnabas split up after their first missionary journey because of some dysfunction going on in their relationship, Paul then looks at Silas and says, I want you to go with me on my next trip. Now, of course, that's a Robbie Hendrick paraphrase. Paul chose Silas to become his co-worker during this second missionary journey. And now he is one of the founders of the church in Thessalonica. And let's be honest, founders of churches mean something to those who came together initially when the church was started. And now they get a letter from this man. 
Of course it carried weight and authority. Then there was young Timothy. He shows up first in Acts chapter 16. When Paul came to Derby and Lystra, he saw Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer and his father was a Greek. Not a great combination there. He was well spoken of by the brothers. The Bible tells us that he had already come to faith in Christ. Paul took him and he circumcised him because he became this companion of Paul's and Paul did not want to create a stumbling block for anybody. And he, too, was delivering the Jerusalem Council verdict to other churches along with Paul. In Acts 16, 5, the Bible says the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. Paul calls Timothy his spiritual son as well as his fellow co-worker. And Paul sent him out several times to help with struggling churches. This is one of those times he sent him back to Thessalonica and said, go check on the church. We're hearing things. In fact, 1 Thessalonians is written because Timothy has just gotten back to Paul after visiting the church and says, you know what, things are going well. Timothy is listed as a co-author in six of Paul's letters. He was arrested and he was beaten just like Paul and was at one time the pastor in the Ephesian church. Of course, when he spoke, it carried weight. Finally, of course, there's Paul, obviously an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, though not stated here in the letter. He was certainly known by all believers in the church. And when he was the one who put the pen to paper, because a couple of times he will say I in the letter, we're going to read that as we go. He is basically saying, these words that I write to you are not the words of your leader, Silas. These words are not the words of your encourager, Timothy. These words are not the words of your mentor, Paul. These words are the very words of God. Therefore, receive them with authority. And with the history of these three men, authority of the letter was really not an issue for them when they got it. They all three agreed when the church was planted by them, and they all three agreed to the letter that was sent, giving this letter full authority. But you must also see something that's pretty incredible, and that is not only did it arrive with authority, it was also a letter that was pretty much brother to brother and friend to friend. It was a letter that was written to a community of people. Yes, it was full authority, but it was also a friend to friend. How do we know? If we go back to Acts 17, we read that Paul explained and proved it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, basically saying, this Jesus who I proclaim to you is the Christ. And those people came to know Christ. And when they did, they became brothers in the faith with Paul. I love verse 4. Some of them, Jews, were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. They're now brothers and sisters in Christ, and this letter is sent to them too. And so what we see here is the makeup of the church. This word church, I, I think this is just so great. This word church, ecclesia, means the gathering of people, the gathering people the gathering of God's people, the people of God, living in community together. And here's what we see. We see Jews who came to faith in Christ. We see Gentiles who became proselytes. They circumcised themselves and followed Jewish tradition and orthodoxy. We see Gentiles who didn't circumcise themselves but professed Christ anyway because the Jerusalem Council said you don't have to be circumcised to be a believer. They chose not to. And so there were Gentiles that were not proselytes. And then, of course, there were women. I think the question is, how do we know that there were Gentiles at all in this church? Not only does Acts 17 tell us this, but we read it in verse 9 of 1 Timothy 1. You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Jews didn't follow idols. They had to be Gentiles. And then, there, of course, there are these women, considered low class of the day, but here, and I love the language, it says prominent women. Those of the upper class. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, verse 12, the Bible says, Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. Women of high standing. You know, these are the same women that I believe later in life pop up like when we go back in time and we read about Jesus and we see the women that are everywhere. These are women that helped Jesus along the way. It's the same type of thing. I think this language is absolutely beautiful. The makeup of the Thessalonian church 
Converted Jews, proselytes, Gentiles who converted to Judaism, Gentiles themselves, women, prominent and high standing. Paul is calling these people, these lovers of Christ, these misfits, Jews, Gentiles, and high profile women, the people of God. This is a term that up to now has only been used for the nation of Israel till the time of Jesus. And now he's saying the Gentiles are included. You're the church. When you put your faith in Christ. And so are the women. You see, we remember the story of the temple back when Jesus was alive. And there was this inner piece of the temple called the Holy of Holies, the place that only the high priest could go once a year. And then outside of that was the holy place. And then there was the place for Israel to make sacrifices, which was a little bit wider, but only for men. And then there was this place called the court of women where women could gather. And then outside of that was the Gentile court, the place where Gentiles could gather. You see, the further out you go, the less holy that you are, according to the temple. And we remember that when Jesus died on the cross, that great veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place was ripped in two. Which symbolically gave all people access to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, male, female. The church. In Thessalonica. A union of believers living in community. Paul is teaching them, you are the church. You're the new covenant church. And what gives this such a community feel is not the salutation that says Paul, Silas, and Timothy. But actually what's not in the salutation. What makes this letter so personal is not the address But what is missing from the address? You see, usually when Paul writes a letter, he prefaces it with what? His authoritative title. What does he say? Apostle. 1 Timothy 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Okay, really? Paul actually wrote to Timothy and he used the word apostle. Why? To show him his authority. 2 Timothy 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Titus 1.1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Romans 1, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. What is he saying? This is coming from God, so pay attention to the letter that you're receiving from me. I have the authority of God to speak the words of God, so receive this letter as if it is a letter from God. 1 Corinthians 1, 1, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Many times Paul gives his credentials, but not here in 1 Thessalonians. Why? Because the authority of the letter, the call of his own life to be an apostle was never in question for this church. He was known by them. There was no question of his authority, no reason to doubt his credentials. He had visited there. He was trying to get back there. He wanted to visit again. He mentions his apostleship one time in 1 Thessalonians. And he does it in such a way that he's basically saying, I did not use my title to ask you for money. And so he uses it almost in a negative way. And so at least here in 1 Thessalonians, there is no authoritative title, though the letter did come to them with authority. It was both authoritative and brother and sister in Christ. And what we're going to see in this letter as it begins to unfold is we're going to address certain theological issues that pop up. Since now this church is newly planted and these are relatively new converts, it is important that Paul continue to encourage them and teach them over and over and over again, not only with visits from people, but also letters. Continue to teach them who God is and who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And because of that, how we then should put our faith in him and live for him. In this particular letter, Paul is going to defend the gospel. He's going to talk about how to encourage when persecuted. He's going to talk about giving directions on how to live, serving the true and living God. He's going to teach them about Christ's return, which we call eschatology. He's going to talk about election. He's going to speak about joy in the new covenant church and increase their knowledge as they continue to ask questions. And dare I say that all of those things are only in verses 2 through 10. The beauty of the letter is 2 through 10 sets the stage for the rest of the book. 
He lists these things and then he goes back and he attacks them one at a time throughout the rest of the book. I want to cover one. I promise I'm almost done. Hang in there. I want to cover just one aspect of practical theology and it comes out of verse 1. Look with me at verse 1 again. To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Now we've already talked about the practical implications of Paul calling them the church and how important that is. Inclusion of the Gentiles and women. But there are two other real theological points that jump out, even in verse 1, that we need to talk about. One is Paul has now declared the Trinity to them. God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that simple word and that we see. Paul is connecting God the Father to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is calling the two one. This is a declaration that Jesus is not only the Son of God, but that He is God. He is the Messiah. He is all that He claimed and professed in Acts chapter 17. He is the Holy One. He is the one of the same substance as the Father, who is equal in power and glory. We barely get past his name before Paul has launched this beautiful theology of the Trinity. And because of this simple word and, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, he must be worshipped in glory. This verse says that the church is in both God the Father and and the Lord Jesus Christ. And as an aside, I would tell you that the word Lord tells us something too, but I don't have time to go there. The second practical thing that we see is really prayer. Paul prays grace and peace to you. This again is the declaration of who alone gives grace and who gives peace, the triune God alone. And that grace comes to us because of his love for us. It is not merit-based on our part and when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ the Bible tells us that we have peace this is Romans 5 1 since we have been justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ we don't even get out of the salutation of verse 1 without seeing theology jumping off the page at us from this man apostle all right two takeaways and I'm done y'all still with me kind of sort of one is pretty obvious, I'm going to just say it anyway. It's the sovereignty of God over all things. Listen, I would beg to ask the question, did King Philip have any clue at all that his kingdom at some point was going to be used to advance the gospel? Probably not. Did Alexander the Great have any clue that his kingdom what set the stage for gospel expansion in Macedonia? I don't think so. When Cassander named 26 small villages, one name after his own wife, Thessalonica, he had no clue that God would use that name and put it in his holy word for an eternity. But there it is. Do you think the Romans, when they built the roads, said, we will do this for God so that the gospel will go forward? No. But God took all of those things and accomplished his perfect, holy will. Rome had no clue that this 696-mile road was going to be a main thoroughfare for the gospel to spread. Proverbs 21.1 tells us the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. And what was true of Philip, what was true of Alexander the Great, the greatest kingdom that ever lived on earth, what is true of Cassander and the emperor of Rome is true of us today. God's plan will not be thwarted. And we must come to grips with that, even when things aren't going the way that we would hope. And we must understand it. That God is going to use everything that happens on this planet for his glory at some level. And it's going to all come together soon. 
That's number one. Number two, we as the church are called to live in community. Yes, there are people like Paul and Silas and Timothy that lead. And then there are the rest of us who live together. In and through our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your word and thankful, Lord, for all that it teaches us. We thank you for preserving it from generation to generation. God, as we see your sovereignty in all things, we do rest in your goodness. We rest in your power. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you are doing. Continue to remind us of your authority as we live in community with one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We respond by singing uh, in our family song collection, 122, Loved with an Everlasting Love. Let's stand and sing. And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. And all the God's people said, Amen. Amen.